Hello, and welcome to today's IEEE virtual event, Transforming the Engineering Design Process to Leverage the Latest Digital and AI Technologies. This webinar is sponsored by IEEE Discovery Point for Communication, the all-in-one platform built for engineers in industry to design and develop technology solutions. With it, they can find reliable, industry-specific solutions to support every stage of product design and development. It supports engineers with expertly curated content from research documents, standards from IEEE and other standards developers, vendor parts and components, industry news, blogs and white papers, online courses, ebook titles, and information about industry events. And all that information is placed into an AI-powered platform with features such as insights generated by machine learning, proprietary expert maintained taxonomies to make it easy to find the information you need, curated dashboards on hot topics such as 5G, IoT, and smart vehicles, workflow tools, custom dashboards, collaboration tools designed to enhance productivity and aid in discovery. For more information, visit discoverypoint.ieee.org. Let me tell you a little bit about the IEEE. Uh, we're the world's largest technical membership organization. We're a not-for-profit organization with a tagline and mission uh, to advance technology for the benefit of humanity. And that mission is inherent in all of our core areas of activity. As a membership organization with over 400,000 members all over the world, as an organizer of nearly 2,000 technical conferences all around the world, as a standards development organization with such well-known standards as the IEEE 802 Wi-Fi standard, smart grid standard, standards, blockchain standards, and more, and a publisher of journals, conferences, standards, eBooks, and e-learning. All that information is made available in the IEEE Explore Digital Library. IEEE continually publishes the top-cited information in a wide range of technologies, including engineering, computing, and telecommunications. And IEEE has a broad stamp in telecommunications. IEEE publishes many of the most cited journals in telecom, according to the latest journal citation reports. We help drive innovation, and we are cited in technology patents more than any other publisher. We've developed over 900 standards related to telecommunications. We sponsor more than 700 conferences in these technologies, and we publish hundreds of thousands of articles and papers in topics such as IoT, antennas, cloud computing, 5G, and now 6G, network security, smart grid, and many more. So we publish a lot of information in telecom, but back to our mission, we're always looking to see how else we can help engineers, how we can help further enhance the profession and help engineers innovate. So we went back to the engineers and asked them about the challenges that practicing engineers face in their everyday jobs. So in a series of surveys and in-depth interviews with practicing engineers in the industry, participants frequently mentioned the following challenges that they face in their everyday jobs. Increasingly complex projects, aggressive market demands, scattered, disorganized information from a variety of sources, time-consuming searches that hurt productivity, and uncertainty in decision-making. So these are the challenges that these engineers face. And it got us thinking, are there technologies that can help solve some of the issues that these engineers are facing? So the answer is yes. According to the World Economic Forum, that recently an interview with several global leaders to see how they would leverage technology and to become better leaders to address the challenges in a post-pandemic world. And here are some of the answers they came up with. They talked about leveraging AI for better strategic planning, leveraging data insights for enhanced decision-making, using technology to amplify insights, tools to analyze and act on data in real time, better tech to keep employees connected, and above all, all that information has to be kept in a secure environment. How do we leverage these technologies to help solve the biggest challenges of engineers? Well, that's the focus of today's webinar. We've seen in, throughout history that periods of significant upheaval can inspire innovation. We've seen advances in AI, data science, telecom, and automation, and they have the potential to reshape the way we work, collaborate, and do business. 
So, of course, none of this is going to happen overnight. It's going to be an ongoing process. But these technologies can bring about significant improvements in the ways that engineers work. And our speakers today are going to talk about uh, some of the ways in which today's engineers and engineering leaders can leverage these technologies to help uh, see an increase in design team agility, synergy, and productivity. So here are the topics that we will cover today. And here is our agenda. We'll talk about the future of work for engineers, all new digital collaboration uh, and AI tools. We'll talk about leveraging the latest technologies and how to integrate it into the engineering design process. We'll talk about some of that research that I mentioned earlier about the biggest pain points and challenges for practicing design engineers. And then we'll talk about what engineering managers can do to mitigate those challenges and enhance their team's effectiveness, especially by using solutions such as IEEE Discovery Point to address challenges like this. I'm your moderator, Michael Spada of IEEE, and our speakers will be Arun Sundarajan of NYU, David Ullman, a professor emeritus of Oregon State University, Mark Baragri, IEEE Senior Product Manager. Following uh, the presentations by our speakers will be followed by a live Q&A in which you'll be able to ask our experts your questions. Let me introduce our first speaker. Arun Sundarajan is a professor of entrepreneurship and technology at NYU. His best-selling and award-winning book, The Sharing Economy, was published by the MIT Press in 2016 and has been translated into multiple languages. His research includes the study of how digital technologies transform business and society, AI, and the future of work. He has published uh, over 50 scientific papers and uh, 40 op-eds and outlets that include the New York Times, the Financial Times, Fortune, and others. He's provided expert input about the digital economy to the U.S. Congress, the European Parliament, the U.N. He holds a Ph.D. in economics, business operations, and digital tech, and he's also an engineer. With that, let me hand it off to a room. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, Michael. I'm delighted to be here. Well, what I thought I'd do is really set the stage for a discussion that follows. I am going to sort of go over some broad framing thoughts and ideas um, that might help put the broader sense of what are the kinds of changes that we should anticipate in the workforce and uh, how might we prepare for them sort of into context, independent of what, like, you know, sort of what profession you work in. A little over two years ago when um, we started to lock down, um, I had plenty of time on my hands. And so I, you know, was also thinking about, like, you know, how is the world going to change because of this sort of enormous shock to our lives, to the economic system? And I began to look back at, you know, what I thought was the most recent shock of comparable or greater magnitude. And that was World War II, of greater magnitude probably, but nothing And kind of technological innovation that took place um, as a consequence of World War II, that it was reasonable to, to conclude that crisis stimulates technological innovation. And technological innovation that is aimed at addressing the crisis. So that was sort of the first stop. And here are some examples from the World War II era, um, you know, the need to guide projected missiles, dramatically accelerated research into what became sort of like, you know, modern computers. You know, there was a tremendous acceleration in innovation around cryptography, which really laid the foundations for a lot of modern cryptography. And in the aviation Space, there was like, you know, rapid innovation in like aerospace technology. And all of these were addressing like, the interests of some stakeholder involved in the war, you know, technological innovation to address the crisis. But if you step back and look, you realize that crisis also creates complementary or like associated changes. And the reaction to those changes can be even more profound. So during World War II, um, like, you know, over the early 20th century, there was a gradual sort of increase in the fraction of women who were participating in the workforce. But the World War II shock dramatically increased fraction of women in the workforce. This is sort of a reaction to 
you know, not some technological innovation, but a reaction to the situation and a consequence of that situation. And, um, you know, this increase in uh, women's participation in the workforce persisted through the 20th century. Some people argue that it is the most important economic change of the 20th century in the United States. Similarly, people coming back from fighting the war were much more likely to want to move away from a crowded urban environment and into a peaceful suburban environment. And so the war in many ways dramatically accelerated the suburbanization of America. Both of these were changes that were underway but were dramatically accelerated by the war, but not because of some technological innovation that was aimed at solving the problems associated with the war. It was just sort of ancillary change. That seemed like a good lens to in the development of, um, you know, the acceleration of the use of mRNA technology and uh, the development of these, you know, sort of um, um, amazing new vaccinations, you know, in record time by Pfizer and Moderna and others. And that falls under the category of, you know, sort of change that is a reaction to solving the crisis. But the lessons from history seem to suggest that, yes, we will see some of these technological breakthroughs. But if you want to anticipate how a shock is going to affect the world, you can't look in isolation at the technological breakthroughs themselves. Because if you think about it, we haven't had any major digital or sort of technological breakthroughs in the space that I research. I mean, like, you know, sort of the the digital space because of COVID. I mean, we had those breakthroughs, you know, with transistor technology, with the emergence of like, you know, the early Internet in the 70s, its commercialization in the 90s. And on the horizon, we have quantum computing, which will be sort of a huge technological breakthrough. But, you know, when you step back and you start to realize that there's a whole host of other forces involved as well. There are institutional forces that accompany the technological change that can play a big role in determining whether a technology actually is adopted or not. You know, the pace of automation is dictated by how willing large companies are to a recessionary environment, raise capital, which may again affect its technological investments and the pace of technology adoption. A recession on the flip side may make it easier to reduce the size of one's workforce sort of like, you know, behind the shield of, oh, it's a recession and may end up accelerating um, like, you know, technological investments that are labor displacing. Similarly, there's a family of economic forces. And, you know, if I look at um, like, you know, the COVID crisis, we didn't see any dramatic breakthroughs in video conferencing technology in reaction to COVID. What we did see is a acceleration of the adoption of these technologies which caused a platform like Zoom to reach critical mass. And so this makes its staying power far greater. And so there are network effects, economies of scope, and other economic factors that may be altered as a consequence of a crisis. And with an existing technology and no new innovation may cause an acceleration of the adoption of the technology. Similarly, in any technological setting, there are behavioral changes, behavioral forces that play a dramatic role or a dramatically important role in determining whether the technology is actually going to cause change. So back in the early days of Airbnb, you know, Airbnb's technology was what it was, but there wasn't, they they hadn't gone through the process of legitimization. People weren't telling each other, hey, you know, I stayed in an Airbnb on my summer vacation back in 2012. And so it took a few years for there to be sufficient sort of social acceptance of this idea of this being a mainstream way of getting short-term accommodation before it actually sort of hit that legitimization threshold and the real acceleration in its growth started. Behavioral changes or behavioral forces play a very important role in whether a technology, however good it might be, ends up causing some sort of change in the world. And uh, we've seen the social acceptance of remote work, wide variety of e-commerce behavior changes uh, because of COVID, people buying clothes and so on. And it's not as if the technologies and the opportunities didn't exist in the past. Um, It was just that COVID was a catalyst for people to sort of go through that difficult process of changing, trying something new. And once you've tried it and you realize that it works well, you stick with it. And this is an accelerating force. 
And so this is the lens through which I think one looks not just at COVID, but at, you know, a lens through which to look at the shock of COVID. But it's also a framework within which to think about how fast is a technological innovation going to translate into change. And, you know, the future of work is a lot about technological innovation and change. So it felt like, you know, sort of a good way to frame that discussion. So there's certainly been some of the changes that we anticipated because of this COVID shock. There has been an acceleration in robotics investment. There has been an acceleration in automation technologies being implemented. There has been, like, you know, a dramatic increase in the legitimacy of remote work. And, like, you know, this has sort of had profound changes to how organizations design their uh, work. And there has been a shift away from traditional business models to platform business models. Surveys as early as 2020 were anticipating that um, COVID was going to accelerate automation. Now, automation is a very broad term, especially to a group of engineers. You know, in the public mind, it means like robots doing what we humans used to do. But there's a lot of subtlety to it. I think that it's very clear that there are particular characteristics of work that are closely related to their automatability, in some sense, using the modern family of automation technologies. I mean, automation has been going on for hundreds of years. But when I say automation, I'm sort of referring to the um, family of artificial intelligence technologies and to some extent robotic technologies that are the focus of our concerns about automation. And it appears that there's going to be widely differential impacts on different occupations depending on the kinds of things that you do. Um, you know, predictable physical work um, and data processing are the most vulnerable to automation. We've already seen a ton of, you know, computers doing what humans used to do or robots doing what humans used to do in repetitive physical work and uh, data processing. On the other hand, if you look at the other side of the spectrum, which is really where a lot of engineers live, there's applying expertise, a little bit of managing others, a lot of stakeholder interaction as you sort of rise up the engineering ladder, and maybe a little bit of unpredictable physical work. And so my prognosis for most of the engineering professions is fairly positive when it comes to sort of both the pace and the extent to which artificial intelligence and robotics technologies are going to automate. And I think it's important here that you can't sort of use a broad brush to say, well, what applies to this profession applies to all, or this kind of work applies to all, because the predictability of physical work, for example, has been a tremendously important dimension in determining whether a robot can do this physical work. And so there's a very big difference between you know, sort of stamping out things like, you know, an assembly line setting and, you know, sort of logging, for example, household work, which, you know, seems like it would be on the radar of like, you know, sort of automation is actually one of the most difficult things to automate, not because of the high level of expertise needed, but because of like, you know, the high level of unpredictability associated with the physical work. And so while the prognosis for engineering is good, it would be good to sort of like, you know, there's plenty of resources online where you can go and look at the characteristics of your specific job and your specific profession and then sort of make an assessment about like, you know, whether, you know, the, the extent to which you need to be thinking about planning for another occupation. Another dimension that I've studied actively is where in America is automation going to have the most impact? And the prognosis is not good here because all of my analysis seems to suggest that the regions of the country that are currently socioeconomically disadvantaged are actually the ones that are most susceptible to automation-driven, you know, sort of job displacement. And it has to do with the mix of work that continues to remain in these places and the high automatability of it. It turns out that, like, you know, in these regions, a lot of these areas also have a relatively illiquid housing market because property values have fallen. Um, and as a consequence, the mobility of people who may want to sort of leave and go to another place to sort of train for a new occupation and seek a new profession mm -hmm. is also limited by the fact that, like, you know, their, their house may be worth less than, um, like, you know, sort of the mortgage that they owe. Again, this is a message of differential impact of automation. And the final point I want to make about automation is that in the public mind, it's really about robots replacing humans. 
and you know if you get a little more sophisticated you say well it's not just about replacement it could be about augmentation um intelligent assistance um you know tech augmenting the humans um it could also be about like you know sort of call centers there so there's a lot of ways in which humans and machines are going to work together in the labor market like you know sort of over the coming years but the part of automation that is not paid a lot of attention to is the fact that the more profound impact that digital technologies has had on work over the last 30 years isn't in this replacement or augmentation but it is in creating completely new business models that alter the need for human labor in amazon has not automated a whole bunch of things that walmart people used to do using the same business model it has just completely changed the mix of things that need to be done to fulfill your retailing need and as a consequence it has increased the demand for human labor in an entirely new profession of like you know putting things into boxes for shipping hundreds of thousands of people work on that as they did their job but it has dramatically lowered the need for people to check your stuff out because a lot of that has not been automated by substituting for humans but simply doesn't exist in the process at all and so in thinking about how technology is going to affect your profession It's important not just to think about the automatability of what you do, but to look for the business models that are on the horizon. Very quickly about flexible work, um, the same survey that I pointed to that anticipated an acceleration of automation also anticipated a dramatic acceleration of digitization of both, like you know, customer interaction channels, but most saliently sort of within um, organization work. And two years later, of course, that has come to pass. a number of us still work all or part of our job remotely the extent to which covid has sort of caused working away from home to rise the the estimates vary widely you know so the estimates that i trust seem to range anywhere from 40 to 60% of the workforce in professions where you can do remote work do all or part of their work remotely Um, what I have been noticing from students who graduated recently is that the sentiment about remote work is not uniformly positive. Younger people, in particular, don't like the culture of remote work because it does not allow them to engage in the tacit learning that takes place during, um, you know, early times that appear the relationship building. Um, it doesn't allow them to engage in the social interactions that one looks to one's organization for. and you know one tends to have a tiny apartment when one is like early in one's career and so just not having a home office is another barrier and so it's important to realize that uh, while a lot of people who are older and more senior may embrace remote work and sort of like their arrangement um, a lot of people joining your organizations are not going to like it and this is going to affect your ability to compete for talent Um we've also seen a rise in independent work but I'm running out of time so I'm not going to get to that you can sort of contact me ask me questions if you want to understand remote work but the closing point that I want to leave you with really is that as we go through this time of transition we're still sitting with institutions and a social safety net that arose from the new deal in 1930s which had the expectation that everybody would have one or two jobs during their career they would have one occupation they would work 9 to 5 both are protections are like benefits and you know other safety net stuff and our institutions our universities our social institutions are sort of remain trapped in that expectation but the world has changed to a place where we should expect more non-salaried workers who face volatility people having to take 3 to 6 months off from their job because they have to train themselves to do something completely new um a shift in business risk away from large organizations and towards smaller players on platforms like etsy and airbnb and uber and amazon the ability of our benefit structures to not be able to actually support people who do non-standard non-employment work and a real sort of increase in the need for mid career occupation transition often accompanied by geographic transition these are the needs that the workforce is facing and is going to have to face up to in the next 20 years and i think it's critical for the stability of the united states at least that we invest 
in coming up with the scaffolding that is needed to sort of make this transition dignified and to ease this transition because a lot of institutional support at this stage, um, you know, we didn't do a good job of managing the manufacturing transition and that has had socioeconomic, political consequences, a lot of polarization is because of that. So it's really important that we think carefully about how do we create the scaffolding to allow people to transition with dignity during this sort of new and even more profound transition. Um, thank you for your time, and I'd love to hear your question. Thank you so much, uh, Arun, for that presentation. Uh, I could see in the chat there are a lot of really good questions for you. We're going to ask you to hang on within our session uh, to the very end for our Q&A segment. He's the author of the textbook, The Mechanical Design Process, which is now in its sixth edition. He's the uh, author of Making a Robust Decisions as well, Compendium of Decision-Making Wisdom. He has a Ph.D. in Mechanical Engineering from the Ohio State University and Professor Emeritus of Mechanical Design at Oregon State. He's a Life Fellow of uh, ASME and uh, a founder of its Design Theory and Methodology Committee. He's taught design best practices decision-making courses for hundreds of industry professionals at companies such as HP, Boeing, Harley Davidson, Cummins, and many other companies. So with that, let me hand it off to David. Okay, transforming engineering design process with the latest digital and AI technology. My history was already covered a little bit, but I want to point out just a couple of things, and that is the, the term process used in engineering was not common in 1980 when I first wrote this book. And when I first started teaching the process of design, now, there were plenty of processes in design, but they of processes in engineering, that term was not used for what the, the sociological and intellectual um, effort to get from a need to a product. And so that evolved during the 1980s and, and, and subsequently. So I just wanted to point out a little history there. I also have a couple other books. I have some case study books. I got interested a few years ago in Scrum for Hardware Design, and I'm going to bring that up again. And I've got a book that will be coming out next year called uh, Product Design Best Practices, and I'll bring that up again in just a second also. Uh, things are changing. This new book was encouraged because mechanical engineering isn't really anymore. There's very few products that, that come out that don't have firmware and electronics in them. So it needs to be much more mechatronic uh, than it currently is. So instead of writing the seventh edition, uh, coming out with a new book of best practices that are that across all the design fields. Uh, personally, I've designed quite a few different things. I had a bicycle company for 10 years, so I've done hardware design. Uh, I had a software company doing decision making, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And right now I'm working on some electric airplane technologies. Uh, so I've, I've covered pretty broad areas professionally. But what I want to talk about today is the design process. And the way I see the design process is there's some need to some final product. And in getting there, you have individuals involved that are bringing their own knowledge, concepts that they dream up, their ideas, uh, their evaluation capabilities, which is what they're taught at the university and learned subsequently. But in the process itself, there's a lot of learning that occurs, lots of decisions that are made, need for communication, and there's an evolution of information. And for many years, I've been saying that design is actually the evolution of information punctuated by decisions. So let's take this apart and look at each of these component parts. Before we get there, the, the component parts are the learning, decision-making, communication, and process structure. And under learning, there's not only the prototypes and the fail or early fail often, but there's also just the information that's now available on the web that we never had the capability of getting to before. Well, we'll, we'll get into all of these, but I just wanted to give you a little tease at the beginning of what we're going to do. So let's look at learning first. And... The biggest thing for learning as an engineer is building prototypes. And by prototypes, I mean this in the broadest sense. I mean both virtual prototypes and physical prototypes. And I give some statistics here. None of these are mine. They're one that I found in the, in the development of the new text. 
And I found it because there's a lot of information available now that would have been difficult for me to get to 20, 30 years ago. But some real important points here, the very first one is that, that Dyson, when he was designing the cyclonic vacuum, he was developing a new technology. There were no equations for him to write, at least with his level of knowledge, for how to separate dirt from air. And he built thousands of prototypes. In reading his books, I don't think he had a very good design process. He sort of was a random walk, but he got there and developed a whole new technology. Even as early as 2008, there were people were typically building many, many simulations and physical prototypes. And then a very recent survey by, by Gasol showed that, that engineers, and when they use the word prototype, pretty sure they mean physical. And uh, they talk about the analytical or the virtual or the simulation. And so a lot of engineers, about half the engineers, do some of each. At the bottom there, the physical prototypes before design is uh, finished is four. And many companies do many, many more than that. And so keep that in mind because this is making things, whether they're virtual or physical, is, is how you learn. And so we have a lot of technology changes that have helped get us to better learning. And the obvious ones that are just coming in are the augmented virtual reality. Sketch capture I find very interesting because I had a graduate student doing sketch capture back in 1990. And then suddenly about four years ago, somebody turned me on to uh, Shaper 3D, which actually does it. You can actually sketch on your tablet and it does capture that as a a solid model, which I was really glad to see finally happen. And of course, there's generative design where you, you give the fixed points and the forces and it comes up with the shapes. And there's generative design in electrical engineering and, and in software also. There's also smart products providing user information. The Coke machine came out about eight, 10 years ago. And I realized at the time that every time somebody pushed a button, uh, what they pushed was going back to a, a central uh, repository of information so that Coca-Cola knew how many of each kind of soda it was selling in each locale. And what a fount of great information that engineers are still learning how to get a handle on. I would love to have had some kind of sensors and communication in the devices that I've designed that got back in user information to me directly to help a lot, uh, and it's one of the things I think is beginning to really happen. And of course, additive manufacturing has made prototyping much easier and has also given all these other capabilities that are coming that don't necessarily change the process, but they certainly change the product. Decision making is pretty interesting. Back in my research in the 90s, uh, I realized that design is the evolution of information punctuated by decisions. So I wandered off with some people from uh, artificial intelligence and started trying to develop tools to support decision makers. And I got NSF funding, and I, I realized that decision making has two parts. One is getting the right information or data, and the other is merging it to facilitate a decision. And I was very interested in the second part, the merging to facilitate a decision. So we developed a Bayesian base, which is an AI methodology to manage team-centered, uncertain, incomplete, conflicting, and evolving information, which is what design is all about. And it proved to be ahead of its time. I actually have this company you can see from 2002 to 2014. We couldn't make a living at it. But let me just give you a tease about what it was. So this was not an engineering example. It's actually a group trying to decide where to put wind power generators off the Oregon coast. And these dots all represent the opinion, the evaluation of many different groups. And you can see NOAA on there, commercial fishermen. There is some actual scientific real data. There's bed and breakfast owners. There's all these people. We had them all in one room, and they were all pushing buttons and moving these dots around and uh, evaluating different alternatives, and the alternatives are given as a, a four- or five-digit number, and they had different kinds of features they were interested in, and uh, they evaluated them, and the bars on the upper right were the results, 
uh, with the uncertainty in there. And as you can see, the, the second one, 8678, is currently the, the favorite. It's really hard sell, selling people decision-making. It's hard to go to a manager and say, hey, you need help making decisions because you got too much information and too many people and too many stakeholders. Uh, it's a hard sell, and I never was successful at it. Communication, Arun talked about this, how that all changed. Well, it was already changing, and then COVID accelerated it dramatically, and spent any time on, on that. Process structure is interesting. I, I mentioned I got involved or interested in, in doing a Scrum and trying to figure out how does that impact mechanical or electromechanical design. And so this is a figure out of my book on the subject, and it looks like a typical diagram from Scrum, but it gets really difficult. I can't spend the time on all these different uh, areas where mechanical and electrical is much harder than software or much different than software and makes Scrum difficult. I have a presentation on YouTube that you can go to and, and, and look at these. But, but some of the things are the, the modularity in mechanical and electromechanical is not always as obvious. The design cycle times are always, almost always longer. There's more secondary design activities and so on. Again, I just don't have time to go over all these, but uh, they're, they're available on the web for you. So what do I think is going to happen? Well, I think project management is going to change because we're going to be able to learn more from past projects in ways that we don't currently. And I also think that task management, which is a big part of the Scrum methodology, I think we're going to make improvements there. I think time will come for decision support. When I first published my work in the 90s, there were some people in the CAD community that said, yeah, you're five years ahead of your time. I think it was more like 20 years, and I think that will come. Uh, it's just not here now. I have no idea how the automated activities are going to change the design process. I don't think much at all. Uh, a room showed that, that it was the, the engineering was fairly impervious to the automated activities, and I think that's correct. I think what's uh, a good thing that's going to happen out of the, the the connected world is anticipating requirements. Uh, knowing what your customers want and need is going to become much easier. I think capturing knowledge is going to be happen in a way that it didn't before. In the 90s, expert systems tried to capture knowledge with if-then rules, and that proved not to work at all because knowledge is much more complicated. The generating sh shapes and flow paths and automatic search design, that's happening. Transformation of sketches we talked about. The machine learning will help in risk assessment and prediction of failures. So I see some changes. I don't see anything really dramatic and earth-shaking because it's still a a lot of labor to get from a need to a final product. Thank you for your time. In writing the new book, I'm actively seeking mechatronic best practice case studies for the new text. If you have some examples that you'd like to potentially share with me and, and discuss, I invite you to get in touch with me. My email is, is shown here. It's just Ullman at davidolman.com. I have two websites, one about me personally and one about the book, The Mechanical Design Process. You can get in touch with me by any of these. But again, I can happily send you a, a list of what we think are the best practices for design. And with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I see a, a number of very good questions for you in the chat as well. I'll ask you to also please hang on with us uh, to the very end uh, for the Q&A segment. Uh, with that, let me introduce our next speaker, the IT product manager who spearheaded the research for the development of the new Discovery Point product and, uh, and did a lot of very interesting research with engineers to understand their, their pain points. So let me hand it off to uh, Mark to tell us more about that. Thank you very much, Michael. And hello, everybody. It's very good to be speaking to you. I'm going to be tackling a couple of topics, related topics, over the next few minutes. I want to share with you what we found, the kind of pain points and challenges uh, for practicing engineers in industry that came out of our research. And really also then to talk to how the Discovery Point product that we've developed, we believe addresses and meets those needs in the real world. 
I should have gathered for engineers, IEEE, we have a, a really very rich set of resources that engineers and industry will rely on, journals and conferences and standards and so on. Um, but we started to realize that there was opportunity here perhaps to do a little more. And in fact, there was some comment back from some of our end users, some of our customers, that perhaps we could look at something that was a little bit smarter and understood uh, the work that engineers do in the industry and perhaps we could develop something for that uh, set of needs. Unsurprisingly, we got into a fairly major research program over about two and a half years ultimately into those needs. I'm not going to go in detail through this slide, but I will uh, point out, I think, the process that we followed. We needed to understand about market context. We needed to understand the engineers' workflow, what it is they do at the office, in the lab, at the bench, wherever they work. We need specifically to understand the needs that they have, particularly the information needs, but also the jobs that they're trying to get done. What is it that they've been set as a challenge? Why is it uh, that they uh, find themselves probably overstretched and very busy? And this led to the creation really of some new concepts in our product thinking, and ultimately I'd like to believe some real innovation uh, in terms of uh, new pro a new product discovery point that we've developed. Below the arrows there, you'll see is a whole set of different activities. I'm not going to go through those, but essentially you can see the variety there of different kinds of activities and tasks that we conducted. And a lot of that was face-to-face -face working uh, with ultimately some 800 engineers during that intelligence gathering process. One of the key things that we came from all of this work, key piece of the output that we uh, continuously really refer back to is an understanding of what the practice engineer does. There's a cycle to their workflow and indeed a set of regularly occurring information needs that they face. You won't be surprised perhaps by some of this, but I think it's very good to be able to codify it. Engineers seek to define the problems that they actually have to solve. And that's not always an easy task. They then seek to research what might meet the needs that they've identified. And they perhaps go a little bit further and drill down and identify perhaps a small subset of the potential solutions that they can uh, bake into the products they develop. And ultimately, they're seeking an ultimate solution, something that they believe is going to work uh, for their customers. Um, there's an integration stage, and then there's a troubleshooting stage. Clearly, not everything works straight out of the box. Sometimes there are incompatibilities between products and tools, and uh, those have to be addressed, followed by a launch. And of course, like all good engineers, there's a cycle of looking back over a period and continuing to troubleshoot based on responses uh, from end users. The other thing that uh, we really saw ourselves uh, as the work proceeded on the research was that engineers really work across a continuum. At a very high level, some engineers are engaged in primary research in industry and indeed in academia. Others are involved in development and then perhaps design and deployment of the solutions they've developed. And uh, I've listed here in the bubbles uh, a lot of the tasks and uh, the aptitudes and so on that they need to have. Um, but how to go about solving uh, these you know, variations of different kinds of engineering levels? We believe that with IEEE Explore, which many of you may be familiar with, the research and to some extent the development piece of that work is covered. But we also realized very quickly that there was no single tool available uh, from us or indeed from anybody else that could deliver a solution to those design, deployment, and development needs. Based on that understanding, really, of the jobs that engineers need to be done, we began to see a set of unmet needs. It's always very helpful when developing a new product, a new service, a new tool of any sort to be very clear about what it is one is trying to address 
and uh, often I find myself thinking about, so what do these folks do? How well do they do it right now? Do they have anything that would help them achieve uh, greater efficiency, greater quality, time saving, money saving or whatever? Again, little time to go through this, but I think if you look at the top three responses, you'll see there the most valuable components of any solution was being able to address a multitude of different sources, different content repositories, all in a single search. To be able to find relevant results, not just any results, but results that were particularly focused on the needs and on the solutions that the engineer uh, was attempting to solve for. And also, I think an interesting third point here was the ability to explore, to take a look and to see if they could deepen their understanding of what might be for them a new technology area, something that was adjacent perhaps to previous work, but in which perhaps they lacked a depth of understanding. So could they find content that deepened that level of understanding for them? I'm not going to go through on the right-hand side some direct quotes here. I invite you to take a look at them. I'm sure they will be familiar to you. They're exactly the sorts of things that we heard repeatedly from engineers when we spoke to them about what we could help them achieve. One of the first things we realized is that a solution for all practicing engineers working in multiple industry domains was not something that could be achieved. So we decided we needed to focus to a specific industry area, and we focused at least initially on the area of communications, telecommunications and so on. And what we found was that uh, there were particularly frequently mentioned challenges. Engineers find that they are working with increasingly complex projects, and that's just a function, I think, of com the competitive nature of their industry. There is more competition, there is new technology, needs change, functions change, and therefore things become more complex. The market itself, customers become, I use the word aggressive, that may be overstating it, but certainly they want more and better solutions. Information, however, continues to be scattered. It can be in lots and lots of different places. And it can also be not structured in a way that makes that presentation of information easy to follow. That means searching and the time-consuming aspect of those searches can be really problematic. Engineers do not have a lot of time to search, so they need quick an easy result wherever possible from what could be really quite a wide range of different information types. There's an uncertainty innately in decision making, particularly when it comes to assessing the quality and the currency of the information that is being reviewed. How reliable is it? It's something that uh, I think engineers frequently have problems with. We began to shape a new product based on all of what I've just described. It got us thinking, and we began to see some really some touchstones of the things that we would need to address if we were to deliver something ses successful. And this really became the DNA for what we're now just calling IEEE Discovery Point for Communications. We needed to develop something that pulled together and it effectively curated that allowed content in and excluded other content that was all of a quality and a reliability and a currency, something that sifted through potentially billions of bytes of information out there and found the information that was best suited to the solutions that engineers had problems for. We could see very quickly that some element of automation, AI, machine learning, et cetera, was going to be part of that DNA. But without overstating it, we also knew there had to be a human element to the product. We needed to organize content in a way that would enable engineers to find answers quickly, to discover information in that way so that they weren't searching endlessly for, uh, for content. And we needed to add a set of tools that uh, could be used for collaboration, 
or indeed integration uh, with other colleagues and workflows. And primarily, we needed to put all of this into a single place, a single one-stop solution for as much of this as possible. And that, uh, as I'm saying, really was where IEEE discovery point for communications began to fall in our minds. We could begin to see how we could do this. We needed reliable solutions. We needed content focused on communications, although obviously that area is broad and it strays into another set of adjacencies, which is all super good. We needed to assemble a, a wide set of information publications, those from IEEE, but also from other places. Uh, we're working with partners in many cases to deliver content that is not something that we have on the shelf, but they do. So we need to structure that content together. And of course, we need to have something that makes searching and the generation of results faster and more reliable. So when we talk about IDPC, IEEE Discovery Point for Communications, we use a set of markers, a set of shorthands. We talk about trusted resources. We talk about an all-in-one search. We talk about a focus on communication. And we talk about putting together practical information that the industry can use, that engineers can use to help their work. So I talked just very quickly about, at a very high level, about the range of content types that we have in the platform. Each of these has been developed to meet a set of specific information needs uh, that we found in the process of our research. And as you can see here, we've put together a very extensive set of each of those resources in a form uh, that works best for the end user. And it really is around those tools alongside the content that we believe IDPC is a, a new and innovative and quite, quite different kind of resource. Relevancy was an important component of the platform, as I mentioned. We need to make sure that the content is all understood by the platform when we developed a set of tools that enabled the content to be understood by the AI behind the platform using metadata and indeed the full text itself. And we also, as you can see on the right, wanted to give the end users a set of results from a search based around the different content types, and we call these channels in the product that would meet the needs that they have. We knew that end users wanted to be able to identify the concepts and the documents that uh, were returned after a search. So we developed an insight tool uh, that really looks for the concept that's being searched on and then pulls out snippets of text relevant to that concept in the documents that are actually returned. And you can see on the right-hand side of the platform uh, in a nice, uh, clear presentation, you can quickly check if the article that you recovered actually deals with the concept you're interested in. And that means you don't have to read everything. You just have to see whether the concept you have in mind is well covered in the document and then click on the View button to see that. We also wanted to have a facility to have end users filter and browse content. So that if perhaps there was a narrower context that they felt they wanted to go into, that our taxonomy would allow a kind of a topic investigation. And this is something that, allow, that we built into the platform that supports exactly that kind of workflow. Uh, we've also included uh, standard tools, bookmarks, as you might imagine, saved searches, alerts, a certain number of expert searches that have been put together by uh, one of our subject matter experts. The system itself will generate reading lists once it gets familiar with the searches that you're running. And also there's a, a set of collaboration tools to meet that need within the industry context. Finally, I think I will talk to this slide, which is something that's created by our SMEs, our subject matter experts. These are generated in a human manner rather than by, through the AI. And each of these elements on the right is a topic area that we know our experts on our industry, practicing engineers, have questions around. And each of these will pull up a set of little boxes that relate to the subtopics, and you can get a, a weekly update on really what is happening in the domains that might interest you most. 
as I say, to round up, what really is it that Discovery Point does? And it tries very hard, I believe, successfully to overcome the information overload that we've observed uh, practicing engineers face. It pulls everything together in a single platform. It easily, quickly finds relevant information rather than just information. And it allows the user to learn from the practical and business-oriented technical content that is included on the platform. Thank you very much for your patience and your time. Uh, if you want to pick up on any of this and there isn't time in the question, perhaps, please do feel free to drop me an email address, as I have here, or uh, you can go to our discovery point .ieee.org website and uh, you'll see a lot more descriptive information about what Discovery Point does and how it functions. And at that point, Michael, I think I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, Mark, uh, for that uh, very interesting and engaging presentation. I see a number of questions for you in the Q&A as well. We're going to get to those in just a second. Uh, Mark presented a lot of great information about the Discovery Point uh, solution. If anyone on the line would like uh, more information about it, would like uh, perhaps a demo or a free trial of it, or we're going to post a poll question in just a moment. Uh, please just click yes when you see that poll question if you would like us to follow up with you uh, with uh, more info or arrange a, uh, a free trial. So here it is now. Uh, all you would need to do is click the yes button uh, if you would like to get a, a, a demonstration uh, or a free trial of IEEE Discovery Point. So you can see firsthand some of those uh, workflow features and AI-powered insights that Mark was just uh, telling us about. And uh, we're going to start with one for Arun. You talked about how uh, many different high-tech companies are pursuing different paths in the post-COVID era. Some are still completely remote, while others want to bring their engineers back to the tech campuses. And all those companies are competing for talent. Do you have any predictions how that might shake out over the next year or two? I think that it depends on the occupation that we're talking about. For, for a number of software engineering jobs, it's fairly clear that the model of remote work is likely to solidify, to sort of like, you know, get more, even more entrenched. There was a lot of remote work in that uh, profession, even pre-COVID. I think for a lot of other organizations, they're going to have to balance two competing forces. On the one hand, I think there are some organizations that are realizing that you lose a lot of efficiency in certain kinds of activities from not having people co-located. This isn't just the asset learning, you know, sort of getting to know the organization, building relationship stuff for young people that I mentioned during my talk. It's just that the bandwidth of remote work technologies and the fact that, you know, you have to be on a Zoom call and then off and Slack is sort of fairly low bandwidth makes certain outcomes inferior if you are choosing remote work over co-located work. And so there'll be a push to try and for those kinds of projects, bring people back into the office and the companies that do that successfully are likely to do better than the companies that don't. Um, what's going to be pushing back against that is sort of the legitimization and normalization of having a couple of days a week that you can work out of the home. You know, I mean, like I see the investment banks in New York here struggling with that. They have not yet been successful in bringing people back to the office, even though it is their belief that this is the most efficient production model. And so if you insist on a particular arrangement between flexible and inflexible between at home and um, in the office, um, you may end up losing some of the talent and that may end up negating the efficiency gains you get from the co-location. As some of my colleagues like to say, this will end up being an empirical question, like you know, how it actually all shakes out. But I think these are the two forces, you know, the quest for efficiency and like, you know, the competition for talent um, that like you know, a lot of organizations that uh, I talk to are grappling with. Thank you so much, Arun. Uh, I, I think that really answered the question well. I have a question here for David. You talked a lot about the impact of technology on the engineering design process. What do you think is the biggest impact uh, so far that technology has had on that uh, engineering design process, say, over the last 10 years? I think there's three things. Certainly the ability to make prototypes, physical prototypes, more rapidly 
uh, has made a major change in what we can design. And by that, I mean both physical and virtual prototypes, both. Second of all is the communication over the web uh, with colleagues. And the third is the availability of information, which you guys are addressing. If I want some information on, on some technical issue, I hop on the web and go searching, and you're hopefully making that easier. But I think those are the three areas. Thank you very much, David. I have a question here for Mark. This is about your research. You mentioned in your research that one of the top frustrations was time wasted searching and finding material from multiple sources. And you had said that discovery point helps them do that more efficiently. But how are engineers that fulfilling that need today? There's a variety of different solutions in place, but what we saw uh, in the research really was quite a, a depressing picture that the majority of engineers seeking quality information will go, I'm afraid, to Google and attempt to find it that way. And, of course, Google doesn't uh, validate the quality of the results, the currency, or indeed the accuracy of results. And we did see some end users uh, with multiple browser tags actually open. I think in one case there was an engineer who had 60 tabs open on his browser, and those are the places he goes to regularly. He was the first to admit it wasn't an ideal solution, but it's the best he could do with the information sources that were provided to him. So others perhaps have better provision where employers will provide access to single resources, but there's no sort of joined up single place to go uh, and single place to be confident that what you're seeing and using is actually valid in the way that it needs to be. I should say there's no place uh, other than Discovery Point right now. So uh, mixed picture, but hopefully what we've uh, achieved with Discovery Point will bring a solution to many of those who are struggling at the moment. Thank you, Mark. David, you had talked about the challenges with uh, agile development or Scrum and hardware design. Do you think there's any lessons learned from the pandemic lockdown uh, over the past couple of years that has forced teams to develop solutions around that and more agile for hardware design going forward? There's an interesting tension in that Scrum would like to have everybody sitting in the same room so that they can leverage off of each other and they can cover for each other. I mean, the, the word Scrum comes from rugby. Rugby, the group, the Scrum runs down the field and passes the ball off to each other. That can be done in software, but that can't really be done in hardware. And by that, I mean both mechanical and electrical where the expertise doesn't overlap as nicely. So exacerbating all of that was COVID, which then says, well, you can't be face-to-face -face anyway. you got to be virtual. And so how all this is going to shake out is not really very clear yet because, you know, Scrum is struggling to get into the, to be broader than just uh, software. And counter to that is, the distributed nature of people working from home and other places. It's a work in progress, and I don't know how it's going to come out. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate that. I think I'm going to wrap us up today. Uh, thank you all so much for joining uh, us today. Uh, a link with an access to the recording of our event will be emailed to all attendees. You can also click that icon at the bottom of your screen if you'd like a certificate of participation. If you'd like to learn more, about IEEE Discovery Point. You can see the URL here. Uh, if you want to learn more about our IEEE solutions for organizations overall, you can go to innovate.ieee.org, and you can also visit the IEEE uh, Explore Digital Library. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you at an upcoming virtual event.